Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Thomas Burr. I'm the Washington correspondent for the Salt Lake Tribune and the 109th president of the National Press Club. Our guest today is Penny Pritzker, Secretary of the Department of Commerce. I would like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. And I would like to remind you that you can follow the action live on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLive. That's NPCLive. Now it's time to introduce our head table. I will ask each of you to stand briefly as your name is announced. Please hold your applause until I have finished introducing the entire table. From your right, Jean Coletta, editor, Latin America advisor at Inter as our Inter-American Dialogue. Alan Schleifer, chairman, the third annual Wharton DC Innovation Summit. Michael Norris, CEO of Sodexo USA. Sean McAllister, chief learning officer, global, global markets, US Department of Commerce. Marilyn G. Wax, a senior business editor at National Public Radio and vice chair of the Press Club's Board of Governors. Tom Weiler, senior advisor for international economics, U.S. Department of Commerce. Kasia Klimensinska, a breaking news reporter for Bloomberg and the chair of the Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Kevin Wensing, a retired Navy captain, senior advisor to Powertron Global and the Press Club member who arranged today's event. Thank you, Kevin. Holly Vineyard, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Global Markets, U.S. Department of Commerce. Tony Culley Foster, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council. Arich El Hajj, a journalist for Middle East Broadcasting Network. And Ralph E. Winnie Jr., Vice President and Director of the China Program at the Eurasia Center. Thank you all. The Secretary of the Department of Commerce oversees a broad portfolio, including the Census Bureau, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Patent Office, and several economic statistic and development divisions. But the Secretary also has a very short job description, to be the voice of U.S. business in the President's Cabinet. As the 38th U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker brings 27 years of experience in the private sector to the critical task of energizing the U.S. economy and helping the global economy grow. One of her top assignments is selling Congress on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the largest regional trade deal in history. The measure has significant Democratic opposition, including from the presidential contenders Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. The champions of free trade deals say it will open markets for U.S. exports, and helping American businesses compete globally is one of the Commerce Department's priorities. To that end, Pritzker has visited about three dozen countries in her role as secretary, including Cuba with President Obama last month. Under Pritzker's guidance, the department has created programs to ensure that American workers have the skills that are needed in a 21st century workforce, including a $600 million training and apprenticeship program. Pritzker is a billionaire entrepreneur and philanthropist. She has long connections to the Obama family and was finance chairman for the president's first campaign. She was nominated and confirmed for the cabinet post nearly three years ago. Pritzker earned her degrees from Harvard and Stanford universities before joining the family's extensive business operations, which include the Hyatt Hotels. Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thanks for being here. To, to start off today, uh, perhaps you can talk to us about your job. Yeah. People in this room may understand your role, uh, but for everyone else, it's a big department with a big pur purview. Uh, what is it that you do, and what have you learned in your job since getting here? Um, I have the best job in Washington, first of all. Um, you know, the Department of Commerce, if you think about us, our number one stakeholder is really the business community, and our job is to, and what the president asked me to do, was build a bridge to the business community and make sure the voice of business is heard within the administration and around the world, and to be the chief commercial advocate for American business globally. And so, you know, our job, what does that mean? Our job is really to, we don't create jobs. Uh, what we're trying to do is work to create the conditions so that the private sector can grow, our economy can grow, so that we can have job growth in our country. And um, we do that by being a policy voice, 
But we also provide an enormous number of services that you, uh, Tommy, you uh, referenced. We are the weather service. Um, so we give you your information about weather. All the apps and things that you have are run on our data. Uh, we run the census, and what that means is, yes, every 10 years we do the decennial census, but we're really the survey organization for the federal government. So we're full of information. Uh, we're the International Trade Administration, so what we do is help um, uh, American companies sell their goods and services around the world, and we help foreign companies that want to invest here in the United States uh, uh, invest here. Um, if you need a license to sell a good or service outside the United States, uh, for the most part, that comes through us, which is what got us involved so deeply in Cuba and the opening up of Cuba. Um, we're also the Economic Development Administration and the Minority Business Development Administration. So we give out grants to help communities develop strate uh, strategic plans for their communities, which serve as a basis for funding for uh, the, the rest of the grants from the federal government. We also give uh, infrastructure and public works grants through our Economic Development Administration. I go on and on of our 12 bureaus, all the interesting things that we do, including one of the coolest parts of the federal government is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So we set standards for everything from fire hydrants to skyscrapers to nanotechnology, which is very much um, a fun foundational aspect of how commerce occurs. So you listed a lot of organizations. Uh, what have you learned? That's part of the second part of the question. What have you learned since you've been in office about how many, uh, how it works, how it doesn't work? Well, what let me talk about how we approached this broad array of things that we've done. And what I've learned is, you know, we we started out as a team, a leadership team, to put together a strategic plan for our department, which is really has five pillars trade and investment, innovation, which is really about ma advanced manufacturing, workforce development, digital economy, data, because as I said, we produce two or three libraries of Congress of data a day, um, environmental intelligence. Through NOAA, we produce most of your climate science, as well as we uh, information about, um, as I say, we count the fish in the sea and we tell you how many you can catch. We weigh the ocean. We do all kinds of very cool things that allow for protecting our coastlines, but also allow for commerce to occur. What I've learned is, and we do all of that on our fifth pillar, which is trying to run the place better, a pillar of operational excellence. What I've learned is a couple of things. First of all, you know, these large uh, departments can be enormous assets if they know what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do. And so working with the professional leadership of our, uh, our department, both career and uh, uh, political appointees, we created a plan. It wasn't Penny's plan or the secretary's plan. And, and by virtue of that, then everybody knows what we're trying to accomplish within our building, at the White House, on Capitol Hill, our stakeholders. Uh, in the business community or uh, think tanks and others. And with that, that helps us all be better, right? Your job is to write about or to capture what we're doing in the press. Uh, think tanks want to give us guidance on policy. Capitol Hill wants to tell us either do, you know what we should be focused on and how much money we should have to do it. By laying out, here's what we're gonna, we, want, we think is what we should do, it allows for people to debate, but in essence, it guides the conversation. It also helps you flag your biggest risks. And, and I think that that's a, a prudent way to manage in what's a very complex organization. And, and the other thing that I've learned is the quality of the people in our department are really terrific. You know, I didn't know what to expect. All I'd heard is what, you know, I'd been in the private sector. And I would take, you know, you know, 90 plus percent of the people out of our department and put them in any private sector organization. These are very dedicated people, very knowledgeable in specific areas that are, not, are basically public goods. What they know is not something the private sector is going to be able to replicate. 
And um, you know, when I first came in that fall, we closed the government down. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. What, we're, what we, the public, are telling the people working in our government is, we don't value what you're doing. When the reality is we fundamentally, we can't do commerce without some of the inputs that come. Patents, you can't protect your innovation. We're the Patent and Trademark Office also without the work of the Patent and Trademark Office. So I've learned enormous respect for the people who work in our organization and how important it is to work with them to create a plan as to what you're trying to accomplish so people know where, what success looks like. Well, I'm not going to ask you how many fish there are in the sea, um, mm, but good. let me ask you a, somewhat of a harder question. How would you describe our country's economic outlook and what dangers are there to our country's economy in the next 5, 10, 20 years? I think there are reasons to be optimistic about uh, the state of our economy. If you look at, we're 26 quarters of expansion and we've created, we being the private sector, have created about 14.4 million jobs. Uh, and a consistent job creation over 73 months. Today we have 5.5 million open jobs in our country. That's up a couple million jobs since when I came into office. I'm not taking credit or blame for that, I'm just saying that's a fact that's changed. Unemployment's at 5% and participation is rising. Those are good news and the labor force is up about 2.4 million people. Um, but what are the challenges we face and things that we have to focus on? wage inequality and income inequality, it's uneven. You know, so we have some tech sectors like finance or technology or aerospace where wages are growing and we have others where wages are not or they've been flat for a decade or more. And that's I think playing itself out in our federal elections. But it's not, that's not good for America. Um, manufacturing is, has been on the rise since 2009 about 850,000 jobs have been created in manufacturing. Output is up in manufacturing. Most recently with the stronger dollar and slower global growth, you've seen, you know, we've lost about 50,000 manufacturing jobs in the last, you know, six months. But that's a great source of opportunity, but we've got to invest in advanced manufacturing. We cannot take our manufacturing base for granted. Uh, and then, GDP in the fourth quarter was up about 1.4%. That's fine. It's not as strong as everyone would like it, uh, but it's, it's, we're still growing. The bright spots in our economy are really housing. We're up about 7% year-over-year growth. Uh, the consumer's doing better because oil prices are down. There's some problems with oil prices being down, which is it's hurting uh, not only the oil and gas sectors, but it's also hurting uh, manufacturers and equipment suppliers that supply into that sector. But consumer spend is pretty solid um, and construction is good. We're up about 300,000 jobs year over year. So, you know, one of the things that I think is good about our economy is its diversification. That doesn't mean if you're an employed in a certain sector and your sector is not doing well that you, that doesn't mean you're feeling uneasy. But what it means is, I don't, it doesn't, you know, for probably 15 years before 2009, we had bubble after bubble after bubble. Today, I think, you know, and I'm not a, a, a head of the Fed or our chief economist, but based upon what I read, I mean, we're not sitting on bubbles today. We're sitting on, I think, solid sectors of our economy. What should we worry about? You know, global growth is obviously something to be concerned about and something uh, that our administration works on, particularly our Treasury Department, the President, and, and others. Um, we should worry about barriers being put up for trade. You know, we have a significant amount of our growth and jobs. We have about 11 and a half million jobs that depend on our ability to sell outside the United States, you know, which is where 80% of the buying power is and 95% of the customers. We need to make sure we have access to those markets. Um, and, you know, I think we should not take the United States leadership position for granted. Our leadership position is based upon us having good leaders, and that's something that we need to, as we go into election season, make sure that we assure, not just at the federal level, but at the local level, that we have good leadership. And 
responsible leadership that's balancing the issues between you know, trade and commerce and wages and national security and innovation. Innovation's a big opportunity for our country. Uh, and we invest at the Department of Commerce and Innovation through our Economic Development Administration. Uh, but we're not, the, uh, our posture of training many, many immigrants in our STEM fields, probably 50% of our PhDs and our master's degree students are immigrants, and then not welcoming those people to stay in our country, but instead insisting they leave is a problem. It's a problem not only for existing companies, companies. It's a problem for our economy writ large. We're built on constantly reinventing ourselves. And so it's very important that we have uh, that kind of uh, reinvention. Let's stick on the trade issue for a second. We're hearing a lot these days uh, about trade and potential trade wars that are suggested by various candidates on the campaign trail. Uh, can you give us your perspective on the trade and trade agreements in particular and any fears about possible trade wars um, that have been talked about? Well, let's step back for a minute. <clears throat> the strength of a country is measured on a number of things. But one way the strength of a country is measured is on the strength of its economy. And as I said earlier, 95% of customers are outside the United States and 80% of the purchasing power. And we have great companies and great people working in our country producing goods and services that are uh, that the world wants. I've been to almost 40 countries. I've yet to meet with a leader of any of those countries that doesn't want American companies present and American products and doesn't, well, you know, doesn't want to see policies that also support American workforce. Um, we should not, you know, as it relates to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, lots of rhetoric out there about this deal. Um, first of all, any deal we're with all of you have negotiated deals. Deals don't happen when it's all one-sided. But this is a very good deal. It's a very good deal for America. It's a very good deal for the 12 countries that are participating in it. Uh, and we should remember that there have been about 100 free trade agreements uh, negotiated in the Asia Pacific since 2000. So other countries, their companies, have the ability to access those markets without paying the tariffs that we're paying. I mean, tariffs like 40% on, I think, manufactured goods and up to 70% on autos. But uh, you know, this, this is an agreement that allows for greater digital trade. About $400 billion of our services exports and the fastest part of our, ser our exports, services exports, are digital products. We dominate the world in digital products. That for the first time, there's now a, a chapter on you know, protecting against data localization, creating opportunities for our companies, chapters on small and medium-sized en enterprises. Uh, so these are really, really important agreements. I think the thing to remember is, as I said, 11 and a half million Americans' jobs, and these are good jobs, depend upon our ability to export. Now. Let's not forget we live in a time of globalization and of rapid technological change and disruption. And that is affecting our workers. And we're, this administration has not ignored that. That's why the Department of Commerce has made workforce training a priority. That's why we're partnered with the Department of Labor and the Department of Education so that not only young people are being prepared for the jobs of the future, but if you're in an industry that's being affected by the global forces, that you have the capacity to be retrained or reskilled into uh, equivalent or better jobs. And I was in Houston 10 days ago uh, meeting with workers and, from, and, and, biz, and uh, local leaders on the, um, from the petrochemical industry. You know, the oil and gas industry is struggling, petrochemical industry is thriving right now, and so you're seeing a lot of reskilling and retraining going on, and it's fabulous to see, let's say, that's just one example of an effort that we have at the Department of Commerce of really saying, okay, there's impacts of trade, of globalization, of, uh, of uh, technology, uh, and uh, technological disruption. 
we need to make sure that uh, the people in our country are not you know, left behind in that change. So you mentioned TPP. What is the future? What's going to happen? Well, I'm a believer that this deal gets done because now's the time to do it and because it's good for America. Just, uh, you say now's the time, before the election? I think it'll get done this year. I don't know the exact, I'm not here to predict before or after the election or this week or that week. I'm really here to say this year, this is important that we get done. You know, I, if you look at all the data, start with the data. The data says the cost of the country of not doing this is like $94 billion just in one year alone. And, um, but let's talk about the arguments that are being made about implications for either US companies or US workforce. If we're not selling our goods, if our workers aren't able to produce services or goods that we sell into the fastest growing marketplace in the world, our, their, both our companies and our workforce is gonna get left behind. Because the world's not standing still. Someone will provide those goods and services. We're leaders. We shouldn't step behind and wait, we should engage. And, and what the Trans-Pacific Partnership does is it sets the rules for what are labor standards, what are environmental standards, what are the rules of the road for small and medium-sized businesses. That's who's really gonna benefit from this deal. Small and medium-sized be uh, businesses who are struggling today with variable customs rules or arbitrary tax rules or, uh, you know, uh, procurement that's being affected by corruption, all of which will be positively impacted by the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So uh, I think that, that um, the support for TPP in Congress is stronger than what is being reported in the press. It's very politicized, as we all know right now, uh, but I think the window is this year. Is that what you're, I assume you've been on the Hill lobbying. Is that what you tell uh, senators about this? Is that what you say? You you, you pitch that this has to happen this year? Yes, and I also don't pitch it alone. I'm there with small and medium-sized businesses as well as large corporations. And we go, we've gone to dozens and dozens of districts around the country uh, uh, where we're meeting with companies and workers whose jobs, whose uh, 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 existence depends upon access to these markets. Remember, these are markets where China and other countries have no tariffs, no barriers. We're sitting in a disadvantage today. These are countries in the Asia Pacific where, um, you know, I guess I was, uh, you know, take World Art Group. They make original art posters. They employ 25 people. They're based in Virginia. You know, they, they sell into the Asia Pacific, but their posters have a 30% tariff. And the CEO says to me, anyway, walk through the factory floor, and he says to me, he said, I could hire another five workers if, if this deal gets done. There are thousands and thousands, you know, concept one is, uh, is a, um, a cosmetic company that sells uh, mostly outside the United States again, employs about 25 workers, talks about, I can hire another five or 10 workers if we can have these, um, uh, if I can have access without the kind of impediments that I'm facing today. You know, there are thousands of stories like this around the country, and that's why I think at the end of the day, we'll do the right thing. Uh, question, another question from the audience uh, with amazing penmanship, by the way. Uh, Speaking of TPP, is there any cooperation with the Department of Education to ensure that st uh, current students will enter into a post-TPP market with the necessary 21st century skills? And what new skills are there that need to be, that are necessary? Well, this is an effort that's not just with the Department of Education, it's also with the Department of Labor. So we, you know, addressing a, the 21st century skills that our young people as well as our workforce writ large need is something that we have to acknowledge there's been a ton of change, right? I mean, I find that I'm constantly having to learn about uh, new things in order to do my job, and that's true in general as we live in this disruptive age where technology is playing an enormous role. 
alongside our workforce. And we've got to work with technology, which means we have to understand how to take advantage of it. So the skills that are needed, the coding skills or the, um, the basic math or uh, you know, fundamental uh, communication skills that are necessary in order to be successful, as well as middle skills. There's an enormous opportunity in middle skilled jobs uh, you know, in manufacturing and in other areas uh, for young people. What has to happen, and this has been the, the way that we at the Department of um, Commerce have worked with the rest of the federal government, is to say skilling, whether it starts in K-12 or goes all the way up through community college, university, or other training organizations, has to start with the business community taking a leadership role. And the reason that I say that is we need to understand the jobs and the skills that are needed first. Second is it's local. You can't sit in Washington and say we need X number of petrochemical workers. You know, the folks in Houston know how many petrochemical workers they need. They know how many construction workers they need over the next three to five years. They then come together, and that's what we're doing at the department. We've not only created a checklist so that grants that are given locally uh, meet the need of being both business-driven and uh, business-led and job-driven, uh, but also then we're working with local communities in our communities that work partnership to say what are the best practices in a local community uh, so that you can be training uh, the folks living in your community for the jobs that exist and will exist in your community. And you know the in sectors that are strong in Houston are different than San Francisco, are different than Georgia, are different than New York City. Um, and so that's why it needs to be a local endeavor. But the fundamental premise of bringing together the business leadership with the local leadership with um, your K-12 and your community college and your university and your social service organizations uh, is necessary in order to address creating the workforce that's ready for 21st century. Breaking down those silos is something we at the Department of Commerce are working on. Let's talk about another part of uh, the other side of the country. Uh, do you think the next administration, either Democrat or Republican, uh, will continue to work on deals with the European Union and on that point, is it smart to continue working on trade deals with the EU when it may be better uh, to focus on partners where economic growth may be much faster, in Africa, for example? Well, it's not an either or, first of all. I mean, we're working hard on strengthening our economic relationship with different countries in Africa, but we're also working on uh, Europe. And we'll go this week to... Uh, the president goes to the UK, and then later in the week he'll be in Germany at Hanover Messe, uh, which is the largest trade fair in the world. About 200,000 people go to this trade fair. Uh, it's a tr and we, for the very first time in the history of this fair, which is 47 or 48 years old, the United States is what's called the partner country. And the point being, why would we step up to be a partner country at a trade fair? Why would Germany ask us to do it? It's because um, trade between the United States and Europe is extraordinarily important, uh, uh, both for goods as well as services. And so we have to invest in both the uh, 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 TTIP, uh, having a, a, a free trade agreement with Europe, but we also need to invest in making sure that we have uh, uh, what's called now the USCU Privacy Shield. We, tr we do about $260 billion a year of digital trade back and forth between Europe and the United States. That, all of that has been called into question uh, with a court case in Europe that questions the ability for data to move back and forth. Is it got enough privacy protections in it? We have negotiated what's called the USCU Privacy Shield with the European Commission. That's another thing we need to make sure that we have so that trade, not only uh, the trade that we do today is protected, but also so that our digital trade can thrive and grow. And finally, Europe has got a digital single market they're trying to create. We're working to make sure that that's an opportunity for American businesses and not about putting up walls around Europe so that American companies don't have access, all of which is really important. 
You know, can I tell you something I, I wanted to say today? You know, if you think about a lot of what we're talking about, which is doing trade and business around the world or exporting, what's really critical is that the Department of Commerce has, um, we have foreign commercial service officers in about 75 countries around the world, and we have over 100 US export assistance centers here in the US. These are filled with thousands of people whose job it is is to help American uh, companies do business around the world and to help foreign companies that want to do business here in the United States. And today we're announcing uh, the creation of our Commercial Diplomacy Institute where we're creating, uh, bringing together uh, uh, the advanced training and development that we do for our key leadership in our foreign commercial service and our US Export Assistance Center. We're uh, bringing together our online and our in-classroom training. We've got new and, and uh, internships uh, with industry and fellowships with think tanks for our workforce, so for our workforce at the department, so they can be better trained to assist American companies doing business around the world. We're also working with eminent visiting faculty and um, developing a lecture and speaker series. So I'm very proud of uh, the fact that one of the things that we're doing is investing in our own workforce so they can be ready for the 21st century. Can you give any specific examples of where that's being put into practice? Which companies, which think tanks, which Sure, so, um, uh, so we've got now a fellowship with the w Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, we've got uh, internships at, I don't know the list of companies off the top of my head, um, but we're also we teaching all kinds of training courses so that, for example, um, we've just created a digital attache program so that um, uh, in the ASEAN countries, Brazil, China, Japan, India, and the EU, we're going to have experts in uh, the digital economy. Because as I said, our digital services exports are some of the fastest growing exports we have. And what we want to do is make sure that our people are trained to address the digital economic issues in each of those countries or regions, and that they can advance commercial diplomacy and drive policy change on technological issues and be at the front line for small and medium-sized businesses around the world. This is probably not as related, but uh, economic diplomacy. Uh, you recently traveled with the president to Cuba. Uh, can you tell me what is the next step, uh, and is it on Cuba for the next step to build the economic partnership with the United States? Well, first let me explain what economic diplomacy okay. is, and then we'll talk about Cuba. You know, if you think about, uh, I've been to almost 40 countries around the world since I've been in this job, and every country that I've been to wants uh, they want to grow their economy, they want the presence of U.S. companies, and they want American goods and services. And commercial diplomacy is the opportunity for the U.S. government to work alongside our private sector leaders to make the business case to foreign officials of adapting their policies to improve growth within their countries and improve greater opportunity for American businesses. So, for example, working on rule of law, intellectual property protection, trade secrets protection, access to foreign markets. And commercial diplomacy, literally, we travel to foreign countries and sit side by side with American business leaders and talk with foreign government leaders about the policies that are impediments to doing more trade uh, and to doing more business together or to having the greater presence of American uh, goods and services in their country. And it's a uh, it's really, I think, an essential pillar in our foreign policy toolkit. Um, Cuba, you asked me about yeah, Cuba. Yeah, because that obviously is related in some form, right? That's yeah, absolutely. So I was honored to travel with the president on his historic trip to Cuba um, this past, what, it was about a month ago. It seems like uh, it was just yesterday. But um, uh, the goal, the fundamental goal in Cuba, and, and obviously we're listening to President Castro address his, uh, he's got a big summit of, his, of the government right now. His fifth, I think every five years they come together. You know, the, President Obama's attitude and, and the policy change towards Cuba is really simple. Isolation didn't work. 
let's try engagement. And um, where we came and got involved and the Treasury Department was uh, in the change of regulations that allows for greater engagement with Cuba. So Treasury licenses affect the ability to pay for goods and services uh, in Cuba and the commercial Commerce Department licenses affect your ability to sell certain goods and services to Cuba. Now we still have the embargo in place so there are legal limits as to what can be done. But the new policy is allowed for direct mail, direct flights, more Americans to visit, the sale of you know, and the creation of um, tractor factory in Cuba and other different types of telecommunications support. And this engagement with the Cuban people, first of all, we were warmly received. The streets were lined with people, you know, excited about the presence of, Amer of the President of the United States. And this is very important, not only for our relationship with the Cuban people, which is really what the president's interested in, is uh, helping to support the Cuban people, um, but, and also to demonstrate, you know, for example, there was for the very first time an open press conference where President Castro took pre questions from uh, the Western press. The Cuban people have never seen that before. And so there's a lot of exposure that's occurring uh, and um, the relationship with Cuba at, will evolve. It's not going to, this is not going to be an overnight change. Uh, uh, as the Cuban government clearly states, they're a socialist government, they have a different structure. But, um, but there is an opportunity for us to engage, there is an opportunity for some commerce to exist. Uh, even with the embargo in place, and things will evolve as there's greater and greater connections between our people. It sounds like the impediment is on the Cuban side then. If they were be more willing to work, then we could have more opportunities for expansion of trade and commerce. I think you have to remember this is a country that we haven't had a relationship with for 55 years, and that there's 11 million people. Um, it's a lot of change that's being presented, and at some point they have to absorb it at a rate that they can absorb it. Uh, switching to another country, it's been a while since the nuclear agreement with Iran uh, has been struck, uh, yet it seems the United States is not doing much business uh, with Iran yet. Do you think that will change anytime soon? That's a very complicated situation because while we've lifted sanctions for their nuclear activities, uh, there's still sanctions in place for the bad actions uh, in terms of supporting terrorism and other things around the uh, around the world, uh, so it's a it's a challenge. Um, we're we're assessing the situation right now and trying to sort out kind of what direction this should go. I'm switching back to there's a lot of TPP questions, so we'll go sure. uh, back to that one if we can for a second. Uh, how do you expect the TPP uh, the deal to affect immigration? I don't know that TPP has any kind of specific effect on immigration. I think what it will do, though, is increase people-to-people -people engagement, which will affect more and more students uh, traveling here. I think, you know, one of the things we know is, and you see it around, you know, with countries around the world where we have really active relations, that leads to more and more people engagement, that leads to more and more students, studying in both countries, and which leads to greater understanding and greater engagement. So I think it'll have a positive effect on immigration, but I don't know specifically. I don't think the TPP per se, it certainly doesn't affect our immigration laws. We've kind of touched on this, but there's been so much negative rhetoric in the United States presidential campaign about trade accords, uh, such as TPP. Um, have trade accords uh, not worked well for Americans? No, I, you know, as I said, 11 and a half million people have, uh, have jobs in our country, and these are good jobs that pay uh, above the average job in the country uh, because we're able to export. Our ability to export is often dependent upon our, you know, we, we, significant amount of our trade is with our free trade partners. I forget the exact data, but um, that creates opportunity. Now there are, it would be naive to say that there aren't impacts. There are impacts on certain sectors of our economy. 
That's why you have to constant, but it's not just trade. We have to constantly be investing in our workforce in order to make sure that uh, as the evolution of, of globalization, technology, and other effects, uh, so that our workforce can uh, remain not only as productive as it is, but as employed as it is. A few questions on cybersecurity, which you've touched on a bit earlier today. Uh, what is the impact on cyber attacks on U.S. businesses, and uh, what is the Commerce Department doing uh, with its U.S. and international partners uh, to combat the cyber threat to United States businesses? Well, um, the cyber threat is a day-to-day -day war, and we should not uh, with our businesses. I mean, if you're running a business today in the United States of any size, you are under constant attack. Uh, and so that's a challenge. What we've done at the Commerce Department is, first of all, we created what's called the cybersecurity framework, uh, which is used, it was originally developed for critical infrastructure so that there was a um, framework not only for uh, managers or technicians to be able to know if they're get, doing a comprehensive job on cybersecurity, but it creates a vocabulary and a framework for a board or uh, outside evaluation of the quality of cybersecurity protection uh, at a company or frankly, if you're running a department of the government, et cetera. The second thing is on Friday, Thursday of last week, we kicked off uh, a presidential commission where we at the Department of Commerce or the Secretariat and working very closely uh, the President's Cybersecurity Commission. It's actually a nonpartisan uh, or bipartisan effort. Uh, leaders in Congress have also appointed members to this commission that are put putting together a blueprint for our government going forward. They'll produce their report in December on uh, this, not just the state of cybersecurity, but what do we need to do to continue to be at the cutting edge of cybersecurity protections for our government, for our uh, businesses, for our national security. Somewhat related, uh, speaking of data, intellectual property of US businesses in many forms, uh, music, movies, uh, have been stolen and stolen uh, frequently. How much does this cost American businesses? Um, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but a lot. And it's a big issue and it's a big problem. Uh, uh, and and uh, it's something that we spend at the Department of Commerce an extraordinary amount of our diplomatic and in engagement on cyber uh, on uh, intellectual property and trade secret protection. Uh, uh, it's absolutely essential that, and that's one of the reasons why you want uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It solidifies the uh, agreement between 12 countries on what is the highest standard of intellectual property protection. You talked about uh, income uh, inequality in earlier. Uh, good question from the audience. What can you say about the position of women in America? Do you believe they are treated fairly and have as many chances as men to climb to the top? Well, you know, look, the data speaks for itself. We have to work, you know, uh, how many days into the year it seemed until we're being the equivalent of what a man earned last year, that doesn't seem fair. Uh, we only have, I think, 25 or 30 women leading the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, our boards don't, are, I think, less than 19% comprised of women. So we need more women in leadership positions. And frankly, I think that the revelation that women control, I think, two-thirds of the buying power in the world uh, and make 72% of the purchase decisions in the United States, uh, that uh, women are, more women are graduating from college than men. I, I think that we ought to apply the Rooney rule, if you will, and for every job opening, you ought to interview at least one woman, uh, you know, give her a chance. Uh, you might be surprised. Um, but uh, the reality is, is that you know we, we're we're doing better, but we're not where we need to be. Well, somewhat related on that, um, innovation has obviously played a, a large role in the U.S. economy over time. 
what should the nation do to put more emphasis on innovation, uh, i.e. Uh, STEM education, and specifically STEM education for, for women, uh, minorities, immigrants? I think one of the biggest challenges that we have to do is one is an education of parents and of guidance counselors and frankly of middle school leaders, which is if you don't get on a STEM path by middle school, it's too late. Your, your opportunity to become an engineer becomes more and more difficult the longer you wait to really invest in your math and your science education. And uh, that's something that uh, I didn't really appreciate till I became a parent myself. Uh, and I think that we owe young people that kind of guidance. But we need to make these jobs come alive. And one of the things that we've done is we have uh, started a, uh, something called Manufacturing Day. I think it's October 6th or 7th this year, where um, last year 2,500 companies opened their doors to uh, young people from their local schools to see what manufacturing looks like, to see what STEM looks like. And not everybody has to have a PhD in order to go into a STEM field. You can, um, there are great careers available in manufacturing. Um, but we need to make, you know, re we need to show folks what do those careers look like? What is that opportunity? And you know, it was very exciting. I went to Delaware last October for Manufacturing Day, and I met a number of young folks who had gone to high school and then gone on. They'd gone to a technical high school and then gone on to community college. They had. They were working in uh, doing really exciting things in with both programming and uh, manufacturing, and uh, they were sitting there with no college debt. They were homeowners. They owned their own cars. Uh, they were uh, you know, thriving in their careers. And in fact, some had gone back to finish up and get their uh, uh, you know, undergraduate degree or their associate's degree. But um, what we're trying to do is make it easier for young people to find multiple paths into the careers that exist. But in terms of greater awareness of STEM, we've got to make it easier and easier to, um, for folks to see what those careers look like. And that's something that's happening. You're seeing it online. Going back to trade for just a few minutes. Um, sorry, bouncing around, but a lot of different topics today. Uh, it's the Commerce Department. We have a <laughs> lot of different things we do. Do you believe that China is manipulating its currency to gain a trade advantage? And do you see any other countries doing that? Well. Uh, Currency manipulation is really the purview of the Treasury Department, so I don't want to get out of my depth here. Uh, but I would say that uh, you know the challenges that we deal with China are at the Department of Commerce are less around currency and more around things like intellectual property protection. Or frankly, one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with is steel and overcapacity of steel and. Um, that's a very, very big concern for us at the Department of Commerce right now. There's an OECD meeting going on right now. And frankly, um, you know, the Chinese government needs to decide whether they're going to pursue the reform agenda that they have laid out. They're really at an inflection point. And this idea of, dig of constantly reinvesting in steel when they have, I think they use about 840 million tons of steel a year, but they have capacity for about 1.2 plus uh, billion tons of steel a year is totally distorting uh, the world marketplace, is affecting jobs here in America, is affecting jobs in, in London uh, or in England, and is affecting jobs all over the world. And uh, you know, the Chinese have made a, they've said we're going to export our excess capacity. Premier Li told me that. And it's not fair to the global economy. So that's a challenge that we at the Department of Commerce are dealing with with China. On the campaign trail, Hillary Clinton has said that she wants to shut down the U.S. coal industry. If she's elected um, and successful, how would that affect the U.S. economy? Well, I, I think that... Um, I think we're in an energy transformation, and I think that you, you know, 
uh, there's the coal industry has been significantly impacted by our transition to renewables. That's positive for our environment, and that's a positive trend. But I think the idea of just abruptly shutting down any one form of energy is probably, um, is, is, I think that, uh, you know, this administration has a different approach, which is really one of transformation into an uh, energy portfolio that's far more driven by renewables without uh, uh, abruptly just saying we're going to turn off one source of energy one day. I'm not sure that that is doable. Um, I, I believe Secretary Clinton's also had some concerns about TPP and Donald Trump on the other side of the aisle uh, has said that U.S. trade policy isn't smart. Um, some of the presidential candidates also criticizing trade deals. Uh, what are you hearing from your partners around, your colleagues around the world? Are they concerned the next head of the United States might walk back some of the progress that has been achieved by the Obama administration on fair trade deals? Um, I think that the first thing that I'm hearing is how important it is that we do have these fair trade agreements. And that's exactly what we've negotiated, which is fair trade. And uh, I think it's unrealistic to think that, uh, you know, any deal is going to be perfect. That's not so, you know, the critic, you can always pick in a deal. I don't care who you're negotiating with or what the subject is. You can always find something that you don't like in it. The question is overarching, do you think it's good for the United States? And absolutely, I think these trade deals are good for the U.S. and good for American leadership. And you've seen it not just in terms of economic leadership, um, but also national security leadership and the presence of the United States in the fastest growing economic region in the world and also a region where it's extremely important. You know, so much, our, our supply chains are intertwined. We can't, you know, we need to acknowledge that. So I think that um, one needs to put some of this rhetoric in perspective and recognize how many jobs in our country depend upon our ability to access these markets. Uh, how much of our economy's well-being depends upon access to these markets. So it's, it's um, I think it's more nuanced. Uh, we've added nearly $10 trillion to the U.S. debt in what the last seven, eight years. Um, is this a ticking time bomb for the U.S. and the global economy? I think our debt to GDP has come down uh, dramatically. And I think that, uh, I think that if you look at, uh, the U.S. financially, we're sitting in a pretty good position, but I would defer to our Treasury Secretary to talk about the U.S. balance sheet. Okay. Uh, we talked about energy a few minutes ago. The United States has been approaching energy independence, but the Keystone Pipeline was not approved. Uh, has this affected U.S.-Canadian relations uh, and America's uh, uh, aim for energy independence? So, um, you know, when... Uh, 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 Prime Minister Trudeau was here. I think relations, as you saw from all of the publicity around that visit, are very positive. Uh, I know on a working level my relationship with my counterparts, uh, the two ministers that I work, is a very positive and constructive one. So, uh, uh, you know, we're moving forward addressing lots of issues and trying to make the North American platform the most globally competitive platform for commerce and trade in the world. Uh, I believe this is one of your predecessor's ideas, but what happened to the National Export Initiative? Uh, it was supposed to, I believe, fail, uh, supposed to double uh, exports in five to seven years as promised. So exports have grown dramatically as the world has slowed down, as global growth has slowed over the last year or so. That's affected uh, 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 some exports to a modest extent, but um, the trajectory, the long-term trajectory is very positive. Look, the, the, the notional direction of growing exports is very important to our economy. It's very important to jobs. It's very important to helping uh, uh, American, the average American's income. And so, it is, um, you know, whatever a target is for five or six years isn't what's important. What's important is 
we're continuing at the International Trade Administration to put in place policies that encourage the ability for American uh, workers and American companies to be able to sell the products and services that they make all over the world, not just here in the United States, even though we have a great marketplace. But as I said, 95% of consumers and 80% of purchasing powers outside the US. Uh, Why not have both? Do you anticipate the US trade relationship with Russia changing at all in this administration? Will the current sanctions remain in place? Will there more be added? Um, well, the, obviously, the, uh, uh, the decision about sanctions is evolving depending upon the behavior of Russia. Uh, and I think the, what the United States would like to see is you'd like to see a uh, uh, resolution of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, resolution of Crime, Crimea to, you know, that would lead to a changing posture on sanctions. You know, but having said that, President, you know, uh, uh, you know, that we, we still engage, we have to engage with Russia on um, many national security issues, which is continuing to go on because that's a purview uh, that where there's overlap of certain responsibilities with Russia. Not our national security, but third party situations like dealing in Syria or dealing with ISIL. Uh, I'm back to the presidential trail again real fast. Uh, it's been a somewhat divisive year uh, out there. Do you think foreign investors are hesitant to invest in the United States uh, right now due to the, due to the political uncertainty uh, related to the presidential election? I'm not seeing that. You know, we run an effort called Select USA, which is the very first time, and it's, a, it's an initiative created by President Obama, and we at the Department of Commerce have built the organization to support this, uh, to, to attract foreign direct investment in the United States. And the reason is we know that um, about 5.6 million Americans are employed in foreign-owned American companies. Uh, and these are good jobs, high, and they are well-paying jobs. Um, so we working hard to attract foreign direct investment. We'll have our next summit in June. We do all kinds of initiatives to attract foreign direct investment. I'm not seeing a reluctance by those companies. There's a great interest in the United States. And the reason for that is multiple. Uh, issues. First of all, the respect for rule of law in our country, the protection of intellectual property and trade secrets, uh, the investment that we make in our universities, the commitment to uh, research and development, the productivity. We have the most productive workforce in the developed world. Um, and we have abundant energy resources. You put all of that together and many other assets, the United States is an attractive place to invest for both selling goods and services here, but also as an export platform. Before I ask the final question, I have a few announcements. Uh, quick reminder, the National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists, and we fight for a free press worldwide. For more information about the club, please visit our website at press.org. I'd also like to remind you about some upcoming programs. A week from today, Dr. Tom Frieden, director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, will address the Zika virus outbreak at a National Press Club luncheon. On May 16, Labor Secretary Thomas E. Perez, a possible running mate if Hillary Clinton becomes the Democratic nominee, will speak at a luncheon. And the Girl Scouts of USA CEO, Ana Maria Chavez, will discuss changes she's bringing to the venerable organization on June 13, and I help bring with some cookies. Now, I'd like to... Uh, present our guest with the National Press Club mug. Oh, cool, very, thank you very much. Uh, and my last question for you, ma'am. Thank you. I, I understand you are a marathon runner. Ah. I would like to know, and our audience I think would like to know, what is the secret for training for a marathon? <laughs> Okay, so I, I have run a bunch of marathons in my life. I'm sort of transitioned to running triathlons now. What's the secret to training is you have to do it every day. And uh, they're great programs online, so if you're interested in a triathlon or a mar marathon, you know, get one of the programs and just follow the directions. It's, you've got to do your long runs on the weekends and then, you know, get enough base down. But you can also overtrain, so don't overtrain. Well, we, we all have now homework. Thank you very much, Madam Thank Secretary. You.